<laughs> well, so, I mean, not much. You know, not much new. We've covered everything at this point. Um, just kind of summarize maybe a few <coughs> key points that I think at this point will be kind of redundant. But, uh, um, and feel free any time to, you know, shed any weird questions or statements you want to make, just fine. Um, you know, this was ethics, right? So it wasn't just philosophy, it was, it was ethics. Um, I think the first thing we get out of this class is that morals do not equal ethics. That said, I think in some way we can argue that morals lead to ethics. And one of the questions I think that comes out of that is, um, you know, can you have can you have ethics without morality? What does an ethics look like independent of morals? If that kind of makes sense, all right? And and let's just say it. That's pretty much the term of praxis, or that's the move we end up making. Um, so, like the guy that I was just talking about, um, you know, they, he was pushing him. The interviewer was pushing him, saying, "Look." If, you know, if we can't know these big questions, what does that mean about knowledge as such? What does it mean about the human condition? All these kind of things. Um, and the, and the uh, professor's response was, well, yeah, there's a lot of stuff we can't know. Can we know whether or not a dolphin is a person, scientifically speaking? That's an interesting question, right? Um, and maybe science wants them to say that, maybe it won't. But he wanted to be very clear, and I think this is kind of what Praxis tries to say, um, kind of what utilitarianism was, was we can actually know quite a bit. I mean, when push comes to shove, we, we, know, a sh we know a lot, actually. Um, you know, he used the example, which I've used in here, about landing satellites on moving asteroids. He talked about landing on a comet, same thing. Still very impressive. Um, you know, he's a mathematician, and a, an applied mathematician, which I already mentioned those guys, too. Um, and his course, his thing was the, the equation was so complex that it looked almost undoable to land the asteroid on a moving, right, to move a satellite on a moving asteroid or comet, whichever the case may be. Um, and if you're off by one five hundredth of, you know, you're, you're, it, the satellite ends up somewhere else. And the point there is just to show us that even the mathematical, underneath the mathematical is a randomness that breaks in on us all the time. That's that kind of sense about um, the indeterminacy theory. Um, the sense that we just ultimately, our predictions only take us so far. That make sense? Um, you talk about weather. Weather's a great example. Um, have we gotten better at predicting weather? Seem, What's that? It doesn't seem like it. Uh, that's because you're young. Have we gotten better at, at yeah. predicting weather? Absolutely. Exponentially better. Um, I assure you, when Weather Channel first came out, and they were always the best, they were always the most, right, they were the most professional, if you will, back in the day. Um, they, would, they were maybe a 60%, 60, 70% rate. You still took with a big grain of salt, right? They've gotten, it gets better and better every time. It's gotten to the point now to where they can almost say it's going to rain in like 10 minutes. And it rains in like 10 minutes. And that's pretty impressive. Um, that said, how far out does their predictability go? Accuracy. How, when does our accuracy start to fade? If you're, a, if you're a shooter, right? Same thing with a gun, right? When does the accuracy start to fade? The farther you go. Yeah, right? The further out you go, basically, the harder it is to predict, right? And that's that kind of that same sense that... And I guess what I'm, you know, we're kind of also wondering here, that kind of plays into this first problem, is, you know, is ethics something we can know? Is ethics a knowledge claim? Is ethics the same as predicting the weather? Does that make sense? Um, now, we use mathematics to predict the weather. Can we use mathematics to predict ethics? Which philosopher would you use to kind of use ground that? Kant. Kant? How would you be, how, I mean, how? Um, well, he is a very strong Well, it's, it's because Kant and the, city, and the state are strange. Um, you know, Kant's the first one, by the way, this is true, you can look at it yourself, um, to really argue for what has become the UN. Does it make sense? Um, it's this, it's a piece called Perpetual Peace. Uh, you can Google on the net, it's out there for free. 
Um, and if you read Perpetual Peace, I think you'll be shocked because you'll be reading, this is the UN, this is the doctrine of the UN. That, but what Kant says is, if, <laughs> and that's those big ifs, right? If a state could be held to the same level of a person, if you, could, if you said the state of person, then a state would have, we would, the, our duties to the state would be the same as, this, as to a person. Does that make sense? Where we do have direct duties. But Kant sees that it's hard to make that argument, right? So what he has to say is, if we're rational beings, which he's saying we are, we should desire peace, because a rational, this is that, but this is that sneaky stuff Kant does, right? Do all rational beings desire peace? And this gets into that, that's, but this is why the state's such a problem, right? Um, so Kant has to kind of just assume that, and that's why he almost starts to wax utilitarian, but that's why he also would say that it's not a moral question. Because as soon as Kant realizes he's dealing with consequences, he realizes he's not dealing with morality anymore. And that's why Kant's so weird, right? Is that for Kant, moral issues have nothing to do with the consequences of the actions. It's wrong to use a person's means to an end. That's just obvious. But as Kant will say, and I actually have a little YouTube video about it, um, in a state of war, once I can no longer trust you as a rational being, I can consider you an enemy, and once I can consider you an enemy, I can totally kill you. So, Kant, has, Kant does a lot of that, but kind of, that's why Nietzsche gives him such a hard time. He's like, yeah, that's cute, Kant, that'd be great if you could hold that line, but look at all these things you have to do to, right, kind of plug it in and make it work. So, and that's the utilitarian claim, that's right, you're always doing that, you're always bringing practice back in. And so for the utilitarians, they want to say there's, and I think this is kind of this claim, that knowledge does not lead to morals. So, knowledge and morals have nothing to do with him, with, and that's kind of what he, I think this guy was talking about, the big questions thing. Um, and there's nothing new here. I think you can say Plato and these guys said this from the beginning. Um, at least Aristotle did. Some questions we just can't know. We, don't, we can't know the nature of God. So to use the nature of God to ground our arguments would be irrational. Does that make sense? Um, and that's why you get all these kind of arguments for what is knowledge and what grounds and all those kind of things. Um, that's why mathematics is so nice. It's because it seems to work independent of your opinion and it's great and it's this great kind of phenomenon. The problem is, as we're starting to realize more and more, is that the math circles back around what the philosopher said in the beginning, which was, it only get you so far, right? And how, once you reach that, what Nietzsche calls the abyss, what you know, James calls the more, uh, all these different philosophers have dealt with, um, you know, uh, despair is what Kierkegaard called it. It's kind of sense that when we, when we realize that there's more to existence than we can know, and that influences us in some way, shape, or form, but we can't know. And then also, and that's, and that's the human condition. That's what's this famous kind of sense of the human condition. It's this weird beast that knows just enough to make us dangerous. All right? Um, which seems to be almost dead on right. All right? Um, so, so, yeah. Um, you know, that's kind of the first problem. Uh, basically, that, I mean, it's kind of part of the second problem, too, which is really the knowledge problem. Um, that somehow we're just cut off, right? That when it comes to ethical issues, that's why I try very hard in this course not to tell you what is right. Because the second I do, I mean, this is kind of a weird thing. I can, I get a lot of crap, you know, in those stupid rate your prof things. It shouldn't mean he doesn't have your opinion and blah, blah. What I'm trying to show you is, kind of I was just giving him a hard time about, it, simply saying it's not, no one cares, right? To be able to, be able to ground those claims. Now, you may never do that in your real life, but my argument is, once you get good at that in general, it just makes you a better thinker in general. You may not be in a lot of arguments, but you'll be slower to, when someone says something, you're going to be more critical. That's kind of the term, right? You'll be like, so the nurses, you know, when the doctor says something that doesn't sound right, you know, you'll have more of a foundation than simply that doesn't sound right. That kind of makes sense. You know, patient rights suggest, and you start throwing things like that around. But there's a difference between thinking you're good at it and being good at it, if that kind of makes sense, right? And if anything, I think we're, if, uh, I think we're going to say that thinks they're good, much better than they are. Um, so, yeah. Now, can I make a qualitative claim there? Is it better to be a more critical thinker? In the long run, I, you know, who knows? Maybe ignorance is bliss, right? Experiential, dealing with the state, dealing with laws, I can argue, yeah, no, you probably should know. I mean, 
right? There's a kind of, so again, there's this kind of sense on how we ask the question, right? Um, I mean, the last, I was, I was going to do different things, but the single biggest issue facing ethics at this point is person that I would argue. Um, in fact, it was fascinating. The guy on the radio today's talk, so he's interviewing this guy, right? This is an Oxford professor. This is by no shape, way, shape, or form anybody I would call even close to a head. Um, and at one point, he started talking about consciousness because um, they call it the hard problem uh, in theory of mind and stuff like that. The hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> it's kind of like healthcare. You mean this shit's difficult? I'm shocked. I didn't know consciousness can just be explained away. Um, but he was asking, is my cat conscious? And of course, they used all the tests we've talked about in here, right? What's the test for consciousness? We talked about it in here, do you remember? Is that the mirror? Yeah, yeah right? Yeah, it's basically, it's, it's uh, the mirror test, they call it. It's um, uh, to measure self-awareness, um, which is what most philosophers and, and cognitive theorists have argued is uh, when you can clearly say a being is conscious of itself. So it's literally, by definition, self-conscious. Which we have traditionally in the West held to be what makes you a person. Does that make sense? Self-consciousness has been the, the determining factor for personhood. Um, which again, is why I take interest in the arguments when they say, let's make a fetus a person. I'm like, all right, let's go ahead and do that. Do you know what you're doing legally when you do that? Because once you set that precedence, ooh, now the game's really been opened, right? Right now, the courts have been very, very slow to do that. They've said, no, 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 a person is somebody who's basically 18, and beyond that, we're not going to talk about it. So I think that's kind of interesting. That's that interesting problem of this term of person is legally. Um, philosophically, if we make self-awareness what it means to be a person, then pigs are persons. Chimpanzees are persons. Uh, dolphins are persons. Um, the list goes on and on. And he actually mentioned the age when uh, children become self-aware. Do you want to guess what age he put out there? Two or three. Yeah, 18 to 24 months. All right, so a little bit before two, right around two. Um, there's always going to be a play, right? There's never that's there's that and that uncertainty principle showing itself yeah, again. It was, I mean, in a very real sense, we've always been personhood has always had this argument: which way are we going to talk about it? In fact, just, you can't go down, so. Um, does that make sense? This has always been kind of, the argument's always been, how are we going to talk about personhood? The easy way is just this. This is always the easy way to talk about persons. And then the quite well, are these persons, right? Um, when you talk about it this way, which is what I think James and some other, you know, this is what the care theorists wanted to argue. Um, I don't think Aristotle, Aristotle kind of wants something in between. Mill wants something in between. Right? We've looked at those kind of, you know, Mill wants this and this, in a weird sort of sense, yeah. Um, can we just talk about how we don't like to consider fetus as a person, but we can kill a pregnant woman and it's double homicide? Because that's really, really wonky to me. Well, and that's, so we have to be careful, because uh, it's not merely a pregnant woman, right? It's got to be a pregnant woman at a certain point. So basically she has to be pregnant to the point where they consider it a illegal to have an abortion also. Does that make sense? Um, so they fudge that a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, it's just that I think it shows in a very real way that the question of personhood is, does exactly that thing he's, that guy's talking about. It pushes the boundaries of what we can know. Um, and it's some, in some way, shape, or form, belief breaks in on us, right? You know, the guy kept talking about how, so back to the consciousness kind of problem, um, even if we could measure consciousness precisely, and I could say, when you're thinking about an apple, your brain's doing X. There doesn't seem to be any feasible way whatsoever to measure and know how you're feeling about that apple. Does it make sense? Our feelings, as James says, there's an abyss between minds. He says, it's those feelings. We can, never understand, we can never know how another person feels. So empathy, in a sense, is a non-starter. Does it make sense? It's, it's, and it's kind of shoved on us like it's even possible. Well, you need to, you got to think about how they feel. Oh, you can think about how they feel, but you can't know how they feel. And that's a weird, weird place to be, right? Um, can you really think about how somebody feels if you can't know how they feel? It's weird, right? I mean, it's just kind of a weird, I mean, you can think about anything in that sense, right? But 
What are you doing when you're thinking about it? Are you? And the problem is, we can see it. James calls this the psychological fallacy, which a lot of people, we now hold this. And the psychological fallacy is this kind of sense that when I feel disgusted, and you feel disgusted, you and I feel the same way. And what the science says is, you don't, we don't know that. Your feeling of disgust may be very different than my feeling. James has this great uh, thought experiment where he says, uh, if you could take a brain out of one individual and from two individuals, so her and I just switched brains. James says it would be, there would be no, there's not even, so that, was that silly, what was it called, where they switch bodies? Freaky Friday. Freaky Friday, yeah, the Disney thing, right? James kind of says, no, that wouldn't be, you wouldn't wake up in a body like it's like a spaceship, right? The homunculus problem. You wouldn't wake up and be like, this isn't my car, right? What the hell? Um, the feelings the body creates would be so foreign, the brain would just shut down. There'd be no connections. Does that make sense? And James seems to be onto something with that. Because um, what it ultimately says is our thinking, our reasoning is, is connected to our feelings. And our feelings run ahead of our reasoning, which means our reason, our mathematics, is ultimately the result of feelings and not of something other. And that's a weird, that's even a weirder place to be. Right? And that makes this question even stranger, I think. Um, because if that's the case, if we concede that we're feelings first, and I think James wants to say that's, that's right, um, Mill, Mill kind of holds that view, um, the care theorists kind of hold that view, although the care theorists kind of try to sneak that reason through the back door in similar ways too. Um, Aristotle held that view that you have to, Aristotle's view is a little different, but Aristotle felt that you should, you can't abandon your emotions, your feelings, but that we could in some way, shape, or form kind of control them. And this is kind of the problem. This has become kind of the Western night. This is, you're supposed to control your emotions, right? Um, it's one of the knocks on uh, um, women throughout the centuries. Is, no, women are too emotional. They can't control their emotions. That's why men were supposed to cry, right? Crying was, a, was showing you did not have control over your emotions, right? So there's this, even though Aristotle had it, there was still this kind of hierarchy. There's this hierarchy still kind of stands, right? Um, so, uh, I might have shown these one this before. This is a great, so far I'm about two chapters in. It's really good. I think you really enjoy it. Uh, it's called Rethinking Pragmatism. Um, which is kind of what we've been subtly doing in this, I mean, if you push me personally, and I'll take some questions on, uh, on Wednesday, but, uh, you know, if you push me on these kind of issues, I fall here, basically, in terms of morality. Um, when it comes to, uh, cash value, I think there's a lot to be said over here, too. So I'm just weird. Right, kind of a weird hybrid. Um, I think a lot like this guy thinks, I would argue. Um, so this is kind of a great example of this problem. Uh, personhood, the environment, whatever. Um, this guy just talks about, he goes, more troubling for James, belief in either a biblical God or the absolute can lead people to adopt a, quote, this is the best of all possible worlds attitude. Since everything is well, or at least as good as it can be, it's difficult to motivate people to undertake the work we need to do to improve the human condition. So that's kind of one of those, this is why I said in this course, ideally, we know less than, than when we came, right? Because it's what we think we know about the human condition, I think, that retards our ability to do anything about it. And if we think there's nothing you can do, like the environment, there's nothing I can do about it, that's a, we, that's a really nasty place to be. I don't know, how do you get out of that? Does that make sense? Especially if everything's just a habit, because once we get in the habit of thinking that way, how do you break that habit? Um, lastly, this is probably one of my favorite books ever on James. Um, just to read, this is actually just a really good read. Um, uh, it was, um, it's written in kind of what I would say Jamesian stuff. It's always, it's more modern, so the language is easier. Um, it's called a Stroll with William James. Um, this guy does one of the best uh, views of James, I think, ever. And this kind of gets to the sense of what I was just saying here. This is where I kind of follow James, trying to explain this. It says, uh, this idea that it's belief all the way down. Um, and once we understand that, we can respect beliefs better than when we don't understand it that way. And he says, this happy thought leads James to the discussion of genius. Neither divine nor pathological, the genius is not normal in the sense of ordinary. But what the term really points to is a social conception. And this is back to the you know, the power of society. A function pragmatically fulfilled. I mean, that's what I was just trying to say here, right? Besides, such terms are relative. Genius, health, 
normality, have no essence or measure. Which is another way of saying, when we say things like that, we're back to that, we really don't know. Right? We're making really sweeping claims when we say, are you healthy? I don't know, am I alive? Does what, dead, unhealthy, alive, healthy? What are you, what are you saying here exactly? All right? but, so, anyway. um, the normal man is a nullity. There's no such thing as the normal. All, right? all we know then should induce tolerance of the morbid and further study for as much as it teaches. So, uh, just this kind of sense, and this is again where I think this kind of philosophy ends, um, is how do you live how does the human condition, personhood, embrace our lack of no, our lack of ability to know, to have to know big, you know, solve these big issues? Um, and what does that mean for how we deal with things like in nursing and law enforcement and things like that? All right, so no answers, no answers. Sorry, um, just more questions. All right, and that's kind of the joke, right? The more you learn. The less you know. Right, so that's true.